Bobby McGowan is off tonight, but he'll be back again next week. Tonight we have a special discussion show for high school students who are considering college and their parents. Perhaps many of you have already made your decision concerning your higher education, but if you haven't, you may want to consider a Catholic college or university. In our studio tonight, we have the presidents of three local Catholic institutions who will talk about Catholic colleges and universities and why they're such a good choice. Our first guest is Brother Patrick Ellis, president of LaSalle University and chairman of the Association of American Catholic Colleges and Universities. Welcome, Brother. Very happy to be here. Uh, brother, perhaps you can give us some ideas why the uh, youth out there should be considering a Catholic education. I guess the main idea is that it's a complete education for what people are going to need uh, in the 21st century. The, the people that are high school seniors now are going to be in charge of the 21st century, really. And they need philosophy, they need history, they need literature, they certainly need sound theology if they are to, to enter into careers. They need the career preparation, of course, but they need all these other things if they're to enter into century 21 uh, and, and, and keep it going and have it be a rich uh, experience for everybody. So in other words, you would say that the perspective that they would get from a Catholic university or college would be different than another institution? I would say that all things being equal, what is offered uh, is, is what people, are, I think, are going to be in great need of. The, uh, this is not in any way to denigrate the other institutions. It's very hard to speak very positively of one's own sector without appearing to downgrade all the other sectors. Because, as I must mention to you, Pennsylvania is the national seamless garment of all the sectors of higher education getting along with one another. And therefore, at the same time, in a spirit of healthy American free market competition. The, this little tightrope is, is in the Pennsylvania Association of Colleges and Universities, in which a number of us serve, and where we do all the squabbling before we go to either Capitol Hill, Harrisburg, or Washington. So when we speak of what I consider the definite advantages of Catholic church-related independent higher education, I am not talking down any of the others. It may look it, but <laughs> it's bound to a little bit. Uh, an interesting point there is how can this be? Well, we feel that in Pennsylvania there are 14,000 young people every year who should be going on to higher education who are perfectly capable, who count themselves out too soon, either by a bad curriculum choice in high school or by uh, other, other decisions whereby they, they think we're not college or university people. And they are. St uh, uh, test results and stats all show that. We're in the 40s nationally in the percentage who go on. So that despite the downturn in the demographics, we're able, if we just get the people who ought to be there, we're able all to continue without being at one another's throats in the recruitment of students. Well, now, speaking of recruitment and being at one another's throats, how does a Catholic college or university survive financially? Well, largely, of course, through the various student aid programs, and largely in the context that I just established, that there are many people who belong in college in Pennsylvania who aren't there, and therefore that they, we don't have to go down at the rate of the birth rate of 18 years ago. Mm. People who weren't born aren't coming that much. Even we could figure that out. You know, we were told by all sorts of authorities, be ready. But even we figured that out. Uh, Non-existent people are not about to enroll. On the other hand, the, the uh, participation study that we did in Pennsylvania shows that uh, availability. The other thing is, we feel that in a free market competitive situation, with the student aid programs in place, uh, that we'll be all right. Uh, we may have to do some retrenchment but not uh, go out of business. Another factor there is this. The student aid is to the citizen, and the citizen goes where he or she chooses to go with it. That principle was established in the GI Bill 30 years ago now, getting, oh, 40, 40 years ago, and has been renewed in one way or another in the various education acts. And they are tuition sensitive. They are pegged somewhat to the tuition level where the person wants to go. So they do not favor one sector over the other in any undue way. There's lots of negotiating goes on. So that uh, we can do it. Uh, we, on student aid programs, many of our students work, too much actually, too many hours during the term. But many of them, the, the myth of the affluent uh, 
uh, Lauderdale bound uh, undergraduate with stereo and trans am it applies to a very tiny percentage of our students. Well, how Catholic is a Catholic university or college? I would say it's as Catholic as it ever was in what it offers a student. It, uh, it doesn't impose very much Catholicism on the students because they're young adults and we do no one any favor by maintaining them in adolescence. That I think would be an injustice. But we offer, uh, we require some religion courses at nearly every place and we require some philosophy, but not so much as we used to because there are not that many credit hours for graduation anymore. But we offer a rich array. You can major in religion at most of our places. We offer a rich array of courses. The departments are, from an academic point of view, a scholarly point of view, often the best in the place. And the liturgies and counseling services, activities with the homeless, uh, uh, all, all sorts of participatory kinds of Christianity, following up on the excellent service activities in the high schools nowadays. I think the, the, the place is as richly Catholic as it ever was if people want it, but they, they can ignore right much of it if, if they are uh, pursuing other goals or answering different drummers between the ages of 18 and 22. And we have to live in Christian hope that it'll take eventually. Now, how would you say that the um, Catholic colleges and universities stack up academically? Speaking, of course, from a completely unprejudiced viewpoint. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, how you can do that, uh, there, there, of course, uh, nobody's too bright for any of our places, okay? That you cannot be too brilliant to be challenged at a Catholic institution. At the same time, Catholic institutions are known for being rather caring of those uh, who are, are less well endowed. We can meet their needs, too. But that does not at all mean that, uh, that we can't challenge at the top. And the way you can check that out is Fulbright Fellowships, uh, Woodrow Wilson's when they existed, Danforth's, Marshall's, Rhodes Scholars. Uh, Catholic colleges and universities have their share. And as a matter of fact, on a per capita basis, probably more. Certainly more in the ultimate production of PhDs from undergraduate. That is, people who go on to the PhD or professional degrees like uh, medical and legal. Uh, the results are there, the stats, and each place is getting very, very good at telling its particular public that story, I can tell you. Thank you, Brother Ellis. You've given us a good perspective from which to continue our discussion on Catholic colleges and universities. And coming up next, we're going to have the president of another of Philadelphia's Big Five, so stay with us. At the Donahue Funeral Home, we're always gratified to hear from the families we serve. Over the years, many bereaved families have told us how much they appreciated the warm, home-like atmosphere of the Donahue Funeral Home. To make such moments perhaps a little less difficult, the Donahue Funeral Home suggests that you discuss with us now, in the privacy of your home, pre-arrangement and the financial advantages and peace of mind it brings. That's what living is all about. What can I tell you? Every Sunday you can become more aware of the world around you. You'll discover what's new in the Catholic Church. There's always something new. And Sister Marianne and I would like to share with you the triumph of Catholics in the area. The spirit of Vatican II is alive in you and in me. Well, look at the Gospels. God's Word has always had the answers for your life's problems. I'm Father Lee Four. And I'm Sister Marianne Johnston. Every Sunday on the radio, join us. Up, Up on, on Air. air. Welcome back. We're discussing Catholic colleges and universities, and our next guest is the president of one of the larger Catholic universities in the area, Father Donald McLean, president of St. Joseph's University. Welcome, Father. I'm glad to be with you. Father, um, could you tell us some of the benefits of a larger institution? I think the main benefit is choice. The young person goes to a Catholic liberal arts institution like LaSalle or Villanova or St. Joe's, of a size that's able to offer them many choices. When you come, you, you just want a good education. I don't think it's important that a young person come knowing that they want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a communications expert or a business person. They should come wanting to develop their whole person, develop to the full extent, the full potential that God has given them. 
And when you go to a larger place, then you can develop more of your talents, but you can also choose as you get in and find, I find history very interesting, or I find food marketing very interesting, or I'm interested in engineering. Then you can get into that and make that choice after you've been in college. You also have the choice of facilities, uh, much broader facilities. A larger university can afford to have a larger recreational facility, playing grounds, things like that. But I think the main advantage to a larger institution is choice. Do you think that there's a danger in uh, a larger institution being less personalized and less individualized in the attention that it gives to its students? That, is, uh, that question is frequently asked, and I've been at small and I've been at large institutions myself. And I, when you consider that at a, uh, your student-faculty ratio, the number of students that a uh, given faculty member is responsible for is about the same. It's between 15 and 20 for most institutions, whether you're at a uh, place that has 4,000 students or a place that has 500. You still have that ratio of faculty. <clears throat> but now you go to a department and uh, you can have 30 people, 30 professors in the theology department so that you have a much richer choice of courses that you might want to take in theology. And the same would hold for English or for history or business, whatever courses you want to take. So I think that it, uh, then if you consider at a Catholic university or Catholic college, the focus of the faculty member is on the development of that young person who comes, a man or woman. They want to help that person develop all the talents. So that individual attention is still there. I think whether it's small or large, so I don't see that that's a disadvantage or a loss in going to a larger place. You know, you mentioned the idea of choice uh, just a few moments ago, and the college-bound student in the Delaware Valley has a great number of choices when faced with making his decision for higher education. Why would you tell that student to choose St. Joe's over, say, a Drexel or a Temple? It's simple. St. Joe's is Catholic. Temple and uh, Drexel are excellent schools. You can get a very fine education there, but you cannot get a Catholic education there. And uh, so, you'd, you know, why is a Catholic education so important? Uh, I think it's very important that, and others do too, obviously, though the parents who send their children there, the students who actually come, to get a full view of life. And I really believe that God is a part of that full view of life. And I don't think that you can have an education where you do not consider the aspect of God and the role that God plays in the world. You're developing a whole philosophy of life when you're growing in college. And that philosophy of life is what really lasts you beyond anything you learn in uh, physics or in chemistry or anything practical that you learn in an accounting course, your philosophy of life is what continues. And we, you will get a philosophy of life at any other college because you can't, you can't grow up and not do that. But I think it's important that the God aspect of life, the real aspect, the eternal verities of life actually be considered by the young person and that they have the opportunity to choose and to develop their philosophy of life with a reflection at least on a re relationship to God. I think that's very important. Well, you are equipping your students then with the philosophy and the perspective to cope in today's world. How is your curriculum meeting the challenges of today's world? Our curriculum uh, in, at St. Joe's, if I may use that as an example, not to exclude others, but the curriculum at uh, St. Joe's adapts with the times. It has grown. I remember one time when you could say, Half of your curriculum was philosophy or theology. It's no longer that way. You're, but still, philosophy and theology are required courses, and they're important. You're, uh, we are developing new courses. Computer science is uh, all the rage nowadays. It's, we offer that opportunity. We have very good computer facilities and very good faculty in that. We're considering developing engineering. There's a great need for engineering, especially electrical or electronic engineering. We have a, a rather unique program at St. Joe's, food marketing. There's no other college or university, public or private, in the Delaware Valley that offers food marketing. 
And this is a, an area where you're always going to find work. People always want to eat. <laughs> now, 90% of your student body is Catholic. Um, do you consider your university to be open to non-Catholics and Catholics equally? Definitely, definitely. We do, it is a fact, we do proclaim that we are Catholic and we do offer and require courses in theology of people whether they are Catholic or not. But it is not a proselytizing. We, this is an academic study. And uh, so it's an academic topic, or uh, th uh, our theology and the philosophy. And so it's important that uh, somebody who may be from another religion also know what the Catholic religion is about. But if they also want to know what, about what Luther was teaching, we have courses in Luther. We have courses in the Bible for Jewish people and for Catholics. It's important that Catholics know the Old Testament. So it's, uh, we're, we have no restrictions. It's completely open. But uh, since we proclaim a Catholic philosophy of life, it's only natural that more frequently Catholics will choose us. Well, now let's get to the point that I'm sure that most of the prospective students in the audience would like to hear. And that's what's your social life like at St. Joe's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure that there are many people out there who've been through 12 years of Catholic school and think, oh, I, you know, I want to go to a school where I can have fun and I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about rules and so on. Tell us about the social life on your campus. The social life uh, is much more exciting than many people dream of. You talk about rules. Yes, we have rules. It's not an open, uninhibited campus. There are the normal rules of adults. When you socialize as an adult, you're following certain rules. And this we try to, uh, to teach our students. Social life at uh, St. Joe's is a part of our total education. We want people to learn how to communicate with other people, how to be concerned with other people, and so, and to know that you can have a lot of fun in uh, dances, in uh, sports, in just rooting for a good uh, basketball team, for example. Well, Father, I think you've convinced me I'll sign my son up for the class of 2004. I'll sign up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Father. Thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be right back with the president of one of the finest female colleges in the area. So don't go away. The House of Charity can be found at work throughout South Jersey, wherever there is suffering and distress. Through its agencies, compassionate care goes to the elderly. The needy receive food and clothing. Special education programs administer to the mentally handicapped. Expectant mothers receive pre- and postnatal care, and medical services are rendered to the ill. Support the House of Charity in South Jersey. Touch someone's life with love. I was single and pregnant. I wasn't sure who the father was. Everyone seemed worried about quick solutions, but didn't care about me or my child. Then I heard about MAS. They're different. They didn't judge me. They listened. They're professionals, they're free, and they're nearby. If you're single and pregnant, get help. Call MAS. MAS, serving Burlington, Ocean, and Mercer counties. 609-394-5181. Welcome back. Of the 235 Catholic colleges and universities in the United States, 43 of them are small women's colleges. Can the small women's college compete with the larger co-ed institution? Well, to answer that question, we have Sister Marion William, president of Immaculata College. Welcome, Sister. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Well, Sister, can you tell us about the benefits of a smaller institution? Well, you're asking the right person because, of course, I think the smaller institution has many more uh, things to offer to uh, young men and women, and in my case, women, than the larger institution. I suppose the main thing is the, um, the warm, um, close atmosphere uh, that we have in a small uh, institution. In our case, we have a head count of about 1,800 um, men in the evening division and women in the day. About 500 of those are young women who are uh, in the day school, full-time students. And I think that small number encourages closeness, it encourages contact with faculty, uh, it enables the uh, young woman to get a, a good feel for herself rather than just being lost in a mob and not knowing who she is. Now, Sister, can Immaculata compete in terms of quality of education and variety with larger institutions? Well, we can certainly try. 
uh, we do not have the sophisticated equipment in some instances that some of those larger, very large universities have. But we certainly have plenty to offer. We have a, a fine education. We have a variety of programs. And we try to change those programs as we see the needs of young women changing. For instance, uh, we find that management and science and uh, business courses are now increasing as women are taking their places in those fields. Immaculata has always had a very fine uh, pre-med course, and that continues to grow. But it seems that in a small college, there's just m so much more that you can do, even though you may not be able to offer the variety of courses and of programs that you would find at a large university. Sister, could you give us a profile of the um, typical Immaculata student, if there is such a thing? There probably isn't such a thing. <laughs> but uh, the majority of our students do come from Catholic high schools. And more and more, we are um, getting students from public schools. The majority of our students are Catholic, although we have a large number of non-Catholics on campus. What is happening now, and why I say it's a little bit difficult to give you a profile, is that in recent years, our continuing education segment has grown considerably. And so we have older women coming back to take courses, to pursue degrees. Uh, some of these women had started out uh, in college and were never able to finish. Some were never able to start because they grew up during the Depression days and it was not a possibility for them at that time. And so the, the picture of the, um, well, the Immaculatin, as you would say, is certainly different now from what it was years ago, where it was the person coming directly from high school uh, intent on getting a, a degree probably with the intention of um, getting married on graduation or teaching. They were really the two kinds of things. We often talk about um, when students would say, I, I can't decide whether I want to be married or whether I'd like a career. And now they don't say that because they know they're going to do both. Uh, we presume they're getting married, but they know they're going to have a career. Sister, do you think that um, a small women's college is uh, a more comfortable place for these returning students, as you were just discussing? That's what they tell us. Uh, we're always studying to see how well we are doing our job. And so we have questionnaires being sent, or we ask the returning women, you know, why are you coming back, and were you frightened when you first came in? And uh, we constantly get that same answer, that what they need is a small, supportive atmosphere. Uh, they need somebody to encourage them, somebody to tell them they can do it. They don't like to stand in long lines, not knowing where they're going or why they're there. And so one of the reasons for the success of the continuing education program in our school is that individual attention that we are able to give them as a small college. Now, Sister, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the um, all-men and all-women school became co-ed. And uh, it's very unusual to see an all-women school, and I believe there's only one all-man school among the Catholic I College and so. University. Mm -hmm. um, how does your student body feel about Immaculata being all women? And do you think that it will ever mm -hmm. change? Well, uh, let's go back a little bit. In the mid-60s, I guess, there were 281 women's colleges in the United States. And uh, in uh, last year, there, are, uh, there were 104. I don't think any have closed since that time. And as you said, some of them became co-ed. Some closed altogether. Uh, of the 104 small colleges, um, I would say almost 50% are Catholic colleges. Some are two years, but the majority of them are four years. I, I know that it, I can't speak for the people who follow me, but as far as we at the campus are concerned right now, uh, we do not intend to even consider co-education. We were just mentioning the other day that of the first three women's Catholic colleges here in the Philadelphia area, Immaculata, Rosemont, and Chestnut Hill, they are the three that have remained women's colleges, even though some of the others that were established after that uh, have turned co-ed. Um, I'm sure that in most cases, the reason for going co-ed was a financial one. And uh, we are convinced that there are enough people uh, who really can benefit mostly by um, a women's college, and therefore that there is a reason for us. Now, you're asking about the students. Invariably, the cry comes up, um, where are the men? Uh, if we had men on campus, you know, things would be different. But by and large, the students are satisfied. I always say that um, women's college is not for everyone. And usually the people who do not like it leave after the first year. But our graduates constantly tell us of the value that a women's college has been to them. As one of them said, uh, you made us feel 
uh, responsible for what we were doing. You pushed us into positions of responsibility. And when we left, we were eager to go out and, and catch responsibility someplace else and, and take up a position uh, in a particular career that we had. So we feel that uh, even though there may be some uh, complaints along the way, as there are, I'm sure you know, in all colleges, uh, that students do appreciate. In fact, most of them come to the college because it is a women's college. Sister, you spoke earlier about the changing choices that are facing today's women. It's not just whether I will get married or have a career. And uh, there are so many changes in today's workforce with te today's technology. How is the curriculum at Immaculata meeting the challenges of today's world? Well, I think I mentioned that there really has been a shift in the change of majors. Um, in the early days, uh, the, the main career was a teacher. And so we had history students and English students and French students and so on uh, getting certified to be teachers. Now we find that our largest department is economics, business administration. And that's because more and more girls are going out into that particular area. The sciences have always been strong. Uh, as I said, our pre-medicine uh, uh, program has been a strong one. We have, I was just looking at a, a printout the other day, and I, I can't give you the exact number, but many, many, many of our uh, graduates are now doctors. And so they are able to stand side by side with the men who are graduating from co-educational uh, institutions now and, and really be able to compete. Sister, thank you so much. If you'd like some more information about the Catholic colleges and universities that were mentioned this evening, here are some phone numbers for you. LaSalle University, 215-951-1000. St. Joseph's University, 215-879-7300. And Immaculata College, 215-647-4400. Next week on Real to Real, we'll travel to Villanova University for another special show with Father Tom Legere, speaking on psychology and spirituality. And if you would like to be part of the audience for the next Father Tom shows, we'll be taping at Villanova University on the evenings of May 20th and 21st. If you or your group would like to attend, call us here tomorrow during business hours at 215-668-9842. That's 215-668-9842. And don't forget to drop us a line and let us know what you think. Write to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. That's Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. I'd like to thank all of my in-studio guests for their participation in our discussion about Catholic colleges and universities. And thank you for being with us. Please join us again next week. Good night. Travel arrangements for Reel to Reel by Atkinson and Mullen Travel of Media PA. Phone area 215-565-7070. Today is Pentecost, the Feast of the Holy Spirit. The church began when Jesus sent his Spirit. After his coming, the apostles had a new power to go out and teach the whole world. Pope John asked for a new Pentecost through the Vatican Council. Soon afterwards, the Catholic Pentecostal renewal began. I'm Father Mike McCulkin, and I'd like to invite you to a new life in the Spirit as you open yourself to the powers of the Spirit of Pentecost.